this is a introductory lecture to topic two. And as you know, I've asked you to watch this actually even before you read the textbook this time. And again, there is uh, an accompanying uh, outline that I want you to download and have in your hand. Uh, it's, it's an outline of this lecture so you can follow along. And again, I want you, as I say things, you should fill in some notes and flesh out the ideas because it's, it's somewhat of an open outline. It's just to help you uh, focus your attentions through this lecture. And you will need to you know, know certain facts from this lecture in order to answer the essay questions that go with the assignment. OK. So we're going to talk about today, uh, real quickly, the basic division, or what I like to call a dichotomy, the basic dichotomy, colonial dichotomy, um, that defines the split between the colonists and England. All right. Over the next two topics, the two chapters you read, we're going to see the evolution of the central political and social um, and economic dichotomy that alienated a significant portion of the colonies from England, from the crown, and from the empire. Now, before I go further, uh, I, I'm going to give you a definition of dichotomy if you hadn't heard the word before. You basically, a dichotomy is a division or a contrast between two things. That's die, it's split in half, right? And uh, they are, these two things are or they're represented as being opposed to one another. All right, so something's divided in half, you have two of them, and when they're locked in a relationship, because that's the other thing, they're connected to one another, but they're opposed to one another. That's, that's a dichotomy, all right? It's a dichotomous relationship, two things that are opposed to each other, yet also connected. And uh, like I said, what we're going to talk about is I'm going to sort of give you the sort of general thing you, I want you to be looking for over the next two topics. We'll see the sort of evolution of this dichotomy that, that leads into the revolution, right? And that's what this whole first half of the class is about, moving towards this revolution where the colonies break away from England. So in order to fully understand this dichotomy, we need some background information, some things we want to talk about. And the first question we need to answer is, why does England have colonies? Why does any country or any empire found colonies? Like, what do colonies do? What do they serve? Right? And um, the reason to establish colonies, th there's a few reasons. You know, th they all come under these sort of nationalistic or imperial reasons, right? In that this period of time, and we've talked about this, the period of time where, where the colonies begin, the nations of Europe are rising in power. They've become, in fact, nation states. They've gone from being these collections of nobles, you know, related by kin to these powerful countries that are now getting wealthier and they're getting more military sophisticated and they're in more direct and intense competition with one another, both economically speaking and militarily speaking. And the idea of colonies is you found them in, in, because they do things for you that help give you an edge, that increase your military strength, your economic strength. They are nationalistic goals, okay? And uh, the primary nationalistic reason for England's case and for, for France and, and for Spain and, and the Netherlands as well is an economic one, right? You establish colonies because you want to acquire and extract the necessary resources and products all right, that promote and sustain your economic pursuits at home. Right, we've already talked about this, the whole world of securing access to fish and fur, for example, um, and, you know, or timber, right, and uh, cash crops that you want to grow there. You know, the basic idea, fur, fish, tobacco, slaves, uh, timber, you need access to these raw materials, right, and they need to be shipped back to your mother country to help fuel manufacture there, right, to keep this growing economy and, of course, this growing empire with access to the natural resources that it needs. And colonies become the number one way to do this. You know, for England especially, it's an island. It has limited resources like most island nations. And the colonies become the main way England provides itself with the, national, the natural resources and the extractive resources that a growing, powerful, 
imperialistic mind and nation state needs. Secondly, and it follows from the first, is this idea of national security or increasing military power. You know, this goes hand in hand. These nation states don't see a separation of economic concerns and military concerns, right? They're growing. They're in a direct competition with other powerful nation states, which means direct military competition. You know, the extension of political power across the globe in Europe and in the colonies. Um, this is how they impose themselves. And so there are national security reasons for having a colony. Again, part of it just has to do with extracting resources, right? There are specific resources that are tagged and set aside for uh, military, uh, particularly timber and wood. You know, the growing British Navy relies heavily on American wood, uh, not so much even just for making the siding of the ships and the interiors of the ships. The biggest thing they come up with is they discover in America these giant pine trees, the white pine that grow perfectly straight to 120 feet tall, which is an amazing thing. And when you take off the branches and you make a mast out of this, you could create these masts that are so big they can float and move these ever larger 120 gun warships. So this is a, a very specific thing that they could only get from their colonies. The colonies also have other uh, national security interests. They allow you to set up bases or points to attack or raid other people's shipping. There's certain aspects where you need to find places to set up a military base or a fort in order to compete directly with other European powers who neighbor your colonies. Right? So there's a national security interest uh, that goes into establishing and governing and running these colonies that you expect from them. Uh, and a third thing that kind of comes from the first, it's another economic one, is that what you hope is over time, as your colony matures and becomes uh, a more sophisticated society and community in and of itself, it becomes a market for your produced goods, right? So, you know, you have England has this growing manufacturing base and they have this stuff they extract from the new world, they turn it into finished products. You know, part of what increases England's wealth is having this new market. They can sell it back to your colonies. It's, it's a great uh, closed relationship. And of course, controlling that trade and, and managing it wisely is how we increase national wealth. You know, the England is interested in making England stronger, England wealthier, England more powerful, right? And that's the focus of the home country. And, you know, the goals as far as England and the mother country is concerned are, are rather globally focused. They have a big picture of everything they do. It's about international competition militarily and economically. It's very forward looking on a national level, right? We're trying to make ourselves wealthier, more powerful, not just now, but in 50 years, in 100 years. And so there's a lot of foresight and planning. It's, a, it's this big macro view so that when they look at the colonies, they see it as part of a much larger puzzle that needs to be manipulated and grown. And in contest with other similarly growing powerful nation states trying to do the same thing. All right, so that's, that's England's view. You know, and it's a view shared mostly by people who live in England, particularly the elite wealthy people in England, the landed class, crown and parliament, merchant class, seafaring class, the bankers, right? This is, this is how we grow the wealth of the nation. The colonies, however, are not just an abstract idea, right? The colonies are full of colonists. They're full of settlers, right? And the settlers uh, are encouraged to settle there but they don't necessarily settle there or go there for these nationalist ideas, right? They're not part of this grand design in their own mind, right? There's all different reasons, which you will we'll learn about over the next two chapters, right? That explain why people went. But they're not directly connected to this grand design. And from the very beginning, what we'll learn about the colonists, whether they're here as, as, as indentured servants and laborers, or as merchants, or as farmers, or as fur traders, or however they come over, whatever enterprise they get involved in, or even for religious reasons, the reasons and what focuses, what, what occupies their focus and their energy is their own self-interest, right? They are driven almost by a myopic view of self-interest. They're here to make money. They're here to get a profit. They're here to get ahead. I'm here to farm. I'm here to have access to land. All of these things are, they rarely, 
they rarely see themselves as part of a larger imperial plan. Okay? They are, as I would say, the word myopic, tunnel vision, right? focused on their own interests. And this is actually uh, a function somewhat of a couple other things. It's a function of geography, if nothing else. You know, when you cross the ocean and you leave England several months and 3,000 miles behind and you move away from the coast, you are separated from England, not just culturally and economically, but physically, right? They move beyond the world of being involved in what's happening in these larger nationalist plants. They also, uh, there's another thing that allows them to enjoy a great deal of independence. And um, I, I would say that they have a great deal of independence and they get a lot of non-interference for long periods of time from English authorities. Geography is a big part of that. Also, over the course of the 17th and then the 18th century, there's a great deal of turmoil at home in England, right? There's a civil war erupts, and as we get into the 18th century, you know, England's concerns are often more global or continental focused as they're, you know, locked into several major wars, right? Major wars with other European powers, right? And because of this, the colonists here not only myopically and aggressively pursue their own self-interest, right? they get to do it without a lot of interference. They're not very often called to task or forced to reckon with England's imperial designs. And so over the course of 150 years, a very independent culture evolves where your expectations of the colonists, their sense of rights are very um, hostile to the idea of interference. And involvement of England because they haven't had to deal with it. They've, they've had a whole other culture evolve here. And so yeah, basically I just wanted to say that, that, the, that over the 17th and 18th century, just to reiterate this, uh, a very hard, entrenched, locally focused, fiercely independent culture, and that's both economic and political, and a, a very uh, specific sense of rights and entitlement that reflects this culture, evolves among the colonists, right? And by the time we get to the 18th century, the mid-18th century, and especially just before we get to the revolution, we're gonna see that this culture, this set of expectations, conditions most of their responses to the new intrusion and implementation of England's imperial nationalistic policies, all right? So that's the basic dichotomy that evolves. Now, I wanna say, at times, uh, and actually for most of the time of, of the 17th and 18th century, this dichotomy, this tension between you know, England's imperial nationalistic, globally focused, far-reaching, far-looking um, designs and colonial, independent, selfish self-interest, right? this dichotomy, there's tension, but it's not really problematic. You know, as a matter of fact, a Adam Smith, who writes The Wealth of Nations in, in 1775, you know, he observes that you know, this pursuit of a myopic um, and selfish, self-interested economic goals right, and political goals, in fact, leads to a fairly dynamic colonial British economy. Right? As a matter of fact, if we look at, at, at 18th century um, America, right? colonial America, on the eve of the revolution, you know, this is what we would find. We would find that they had, in fact, created a widespread um, export market in, in, in goods that they were producing. It was a global market from cash crops like tobacco and rice to their timber products to their fish. I mean, it's a thriving export economy. We would also realize uh, that they produced an incredibly large-scale market, transatlantic market in uh, sellable and, and marketable farm goods. I mean, they are producing the food that is feeding England, right? This is, you know, this is actually a success. We see all the extractive industries, again, fishing and fur uh, and, and um, timber, right? These had all been pretty successful. In fact, by allowing the colonists to pursue their self-interest, right, on their own, actually did produce a very dynamic and fairly wealthy, fairly educated society. More, in some ways more so, and it was growing faster than what was happening in England at the same time. And in truth, the English were benefiting from it. 
However, at key points in history, we have in colonial history, there are these flashpoints where colonial local interests will run directly counter, right, to uh, imperial designs and needs and, and the way they want to govern. We see this in smaller levels. Um, you know, England, as, as we'll see, will always try to impose restrictions on uh, who the colonists sell their goods to. And there's this huge thriving market all through the 18th century of smuggling, of importing and exporting goods to France, to Holland, right? And they never turn their back on it. And as much as you would think they would be nationalistic and, you know, defending, no, they want to make money. They'd want to sell who, to whom they want to sell to, in spite of the fact that it is the English government who foots the bill for the colonies and its founding in the first place, provides the military protection, right? It doesn't matter. Colonial self-interest runs counter to that. And this will lead to, especially before the revolution, quite a bit of conflict. But it comes back again and again. See another one. This is a, an aside, but one I like to point out. Uh, there's something called the Broad Arrow Pine Controversy. And Broad Arrow Pine are those white pines I talked about growing in New Hampshire. You know, the Navy had claimed all those. They said, these are for building a stronger British Navy. However, if you cut down one of those pines and just cut it into lumber and sold it for building, you could actually make more money than selling it to the Navy. And there's actually like a little minor revolution breaks out between the 1730s, 40s, and 50s as local colonists in New England cut down all these trees that are, that are set aside for the Navy, right? And they sell them for their own personal profit. That's another example where we have this sort of flashpoint. And these colonists don't see any problem with that. They don't see themselves or they don't really care that much about uh, the effect it has on national security or the growth of England's power. But the largest issue and the one that comes back again and again, where colonial self-interest is most deeply expressed and the one where uh, imperial power is most anxious comes over land, the occupation of land. The one thing that all colonists believe they have an, the right to access to is land. They all want their own land. And the problem with this, this never-ending seeking of land is it causes real problems for imperial organization. The first thing that happens is this, and if you look at the map, you can see it, that um, you know, most of the dense population is, of course, right on the seacoast, right on the major cities of Boston and Philadelphia and New York, uh, Savannah and Charleston, right, and Baltimore. And that's kind of the seats of imperial power in the colonies. But as people moved further and further away, occupying land further and further to the west, right, to exploit for their own interests, you know, they were harder and harder to control. They moved, again, it was a geographic moving out of control of, of imperial nationalistic designs. And the further you moved out, the less you really are involved in England's grander plans. And that's just a, a real practicality. The other problem is, uh, you know, the imperial uh, governments were always trying to restrict the settlers' expansion onto land, and for several different reasons. One, so they could control them better. The other thing is, they didn't want these places all exploited for farms. They wanted some places to be for farms so that they had enough to sell the markets. But these other lands, some of them they wanted to set aside uh, for, for fur trading, right? So these would be areas for fur or for timber or for a host of different things. Another problem was whenever the settlers moved onto land, it led to violent conflict, specifically with Native Americans who always lived there. And this was always a problem. One, violent conflict with the Native Americans upset the fur trade which was very important uh, to, to the empire, right? I mean, it's, it's part of their markets. And if Indians are eliminated and, and, and pushed off the land, that area of the fur trade collapses. The second problem was, again, a national security one. You know, all the Native Americans belong to larger ethnic groups, and they had alliances, large-scale alliances with various European powers. And in order to maintain those alliances and maintain their support, you had to mitigate conflicts between your colonial settlers and those groups of Native Americans. And this proved to be a real problem all through the 18th century, especially as, you know, this hunger and this demand and this absolute belief in the right to occupy land of the colonial settlers moves them further and further west and brings them into uh, conflict, not just with Native Americans aligned with France, but those aligned with England as well. And so this, this desire and demand 
and self-interest, particularly surrounding the acquisition of land, right, on behalf of the colonists, without any larger view of their participation as uh, citizens of England and its empire, right, leads to a lot of attention. Okay, that's, that's really uh, economically and geographically the main way this dichotomy is expressed. And lastly, I want to talk about how it's politically expressed, because this is also very important. Um, what we'll see starting in 1619 is the rise of a, of a definitive colonial political institution, and that is the locally elected representative assemblies, right? That the colonists would elect from among themselves a body, a legislature, who had the main job of imposing local taxes, right, in order to run things and, and for government, uh, overseeing businesses, land distribution, right, the basic governance of things that were of a concern only to the colonists. The first one we see, 1619, is the Virginia House of Burgesses, right? And <clears throat> before we, uh, what, what's important, and we will see uh, a similar style of legislature pop up in every one of the other colonies. All 13 colonies will eventually have an elected assembly. You know, in New York, they call it the assembly. In Massachusetts, it's the general court. Sometimes they'll be run differently. Some of them will be bicameral, meaning there's an upper house and a lower house. Some will be one house. But all of the colonists will create, all these colonies will have a local elected uh, body that, that, whose main job it is to oversee local concerns and the local economy. And over time, uh, they are there to defend the rights and the interests, those narrow, myopic, self-focused uh, interests of the colonists against the interests of the empire. Right? That, that evolves. Now, it's important to note, these assemblies in no way are uh, a source of passionate Republican ideological democracy. Uh, they're not a visionary, uh, liberty-loving institutions. Right? These aren't the, uh, these aren't the Continental Congresses that, that oversee the revolution or, you know, or the conventions that create the Constitution, right? As a matter of fact, they're incredibly self-serving. They're occupied almost exclusively. I mean, the Virginia House of Burgesses is, is a perfect example. Uh, it is established by all avaricious, uh, aggressive local planters, right? who see their main job as helping other local planters cheap, cheat the Virginia company out of its money and then later cheat the crown out of its money in the tobacco sales. Uh, the Virginia House of Burgesses all through the 17th century will basically create and sustain the policies that cheats ex-indentured servants out of access to good land and in fact creates the powder keg, right, as we'll see through this chapter, this growing group of dissatisfied, um, futureless, single uh, men living in the frontier who are well-armed and hostile, right? And because of they're only serving the interest of this really avaricious, self-interested, powerful planter group, like they actually create social instability. Right? They are not, so I just want to be sure that, that these first assemblies are not this sort of benighted, democratic, enlightenment ideology, you know, that, that we see coming about in the revolution, right? Um, they are locally elected, but they are, are very um, narrow in their focus and in whom they actually serve. On the imperial side, we'll see the rise of something else. We will see the creation of colonial governors and their councils. And basically, you know, we see what happens is, is the crown realizes that the colonial settlers and communities don't directly reflect their interests. And so they appoint a governor and they give him power. Sometimes they give him some military power. They also give him a council who are his advisors. And they're appointed directly by crown and parliament. They come from England and they are basically stationed in each of the colonies. And the governor has uh, a number of, of specific powers that, that are fairly universal, all the governors. One, they have the power to veto anything that the local assemblies pass. Uh, they have the power to make all laws uh, regarding international trade, anything that has to do with any military decisions. That all comes from the governor and his council. They try to impose the limits of settlement, 
They settle border disputes between the colonies, at least they're supposed to. And basically, they are. They are the king and parliament's representatives in the colony that represent that larger nationalistic, expanding imperial vision of England in America. Now, over the 150 years of the colonial period, sometimes these governors will be quite strong. They'll be backed by military. In fact, it, there's a case, Edmund Andros uh, in New England, where they actually will be military leaders. They will have real power. Other times, they'll be quite weak. Uh, you know, the governor and his council in, you know, uh, the first half of the 17th century in Virginia is actually quite weak, and the Virginia House of Burgesses pretty much runs amok, right? So it ebbs and flows the power of the governor and his role within each colony. But what's important to note is that from the very beginning, they're seen as outsiders, as uh, an almost alien force here to impose ideas and policies that are counter to my own personal self-interest, and that the colonists themselves feel they have a right to pursue these self-interests. And, you know, like I said, this 150 years, we see the evolution of this tension grow and become a more formalized, specific political, social, and economic culture of the colonies. And so basically, you have to have that in mind because there's always this big question. It's, it's hard to understand how in 1776, what is otherwise an incredibly progressive, wealthy, growing, literate, and stable civilization, right? The British colonies in North America launch, it goes into open rebellion against the very country that created the conditions that allowed them to have all of those things. And part of what helps answer that is understanding the sort of birth of, of this dichotomy and how it plays out and conditions them politically, culturally, and economically. Okay, so that was the main dichotomy I wanted you to have in mind as we begin our investigation of the next two topics. And so that's it. Thank you.